her for her important work. Uh, last but not least, uh, the gentleman from Georgia, the pharmacist on the committee. Your recognition. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate all the panelists. This has been a good year. It's not in your car. I'm not in my car. I, I'm not. Thank goodness. Um, first of all, let me say that you know the administration has supported waiving the World Trade Organization's trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights, and that's very concerning to me. I, I, my fear is that the administration lacks the understanding of, of this complex science and, and, and goes into biopharmaceutical innovation or the economics that encourage private investment in new biotech products and vaccines. I, as a practicing pharmacist for over 30 years, I, I've seen uh, what has gone into research and development, and I know how important intellectual property is to to companies. And this really concerns me that the administration is proposing to give the intellectual property of the vaccine to China. China, who uh, we we know that this this vac that this virus originated in China. My question to you, Ms. Arthur, um, do you agree that a TRIPS waiver for COVID vaccines would discourage innovation and future investment in new cures and vaccines? I, I, I do agree that this is not the right solution for bringing more doses to more people around the world. It would actually hinder the ability for companies to safely partner outside of the country with these new technologies. And it could also hinder companies' willingness to respond to the next pandemic with all the great innovations that we've been working on. I couldn't agree with you more, Ms. Author. I mean, you know, the fact that these pharmaceutical manufacturers, and I know we talk about the price of, of pharmaceuticals being too high, I get that, and I, I, I happen to have the belief that it's it, that a lot of the problem, most of the problem is with the middlemen, with the PBMs, the pharmacy benefit managers who are bringing no value whatsoever to the healthcare system, but are responsible for what has been estimated to be 47% of the cost of medications. But in order for these pharmaceutical manufacturers to continue to invest in research and development, they need to know that their intellectual property is going to be safe. I mean, we've had 200 years of a patent system here in America that has worked and has led to nothing short of miracles in, in the way of drug development. And certainly, what we've witnessed here with the vaccine, I think, will go down in, in Operation Warp Speed, will go down as being one of the great medical achievements of our generation. And for us to even consider, or for this administration, I say, I should say, to consider to give the intellectual property away, that, that, that is just insane to me. Ms. Arthur, what would be a better way for us to be able to get that the vaccines to to people who need it. I, I'm I'm okay sharing it. I'm okay sharing it as long as Americans are taken care of first. We have access. Then I'm okay with that. What do you think would be the best way, Ms. Arthur? So I think first we applaud the administration for doing one of the things we absolutely suggested, which was starting to donate. You just brought this up, uh, uh, Mr. Carter, and I think. Donating doses has been pivotal, particularly as we try to wait for the resolution of the crisis in India, which actually hampered some of the production that companies counted on to deliver doses to low and middle income countries. So we have to recognize this is a global system. And the more we can have high income countries support donations of their doses to um, COVAX and other countries, the better off we'll be. And in the interim, the other thing we can do is absolutely get the free flow of goods get the supplies we need and manufacture doses both here in America and abroad through the great partnerships that are already happening for manufacturing. There's over 250 partnerships and industries entered into with developing country manufacturers all over the world to deliver doses as quickly as we can. And they're projected to make about 11 billion doses this year. Um, that coupled with the great donations promised by the G7 this week should really help to get more doses to more people as soon as we can. And thank you for mentioning that. The obvious solution is to ramp up production here in the United States. That's the quickest way we can get it out there. It saves American jobs. It makes all the sense in the world to me. So thank you for bringing that up. Very quickly, Dr. Tan, I wanted to ask you, um, health savings accounts, they include vaccines as reimbursable expense, and commercial insurance plans also cover vaccines. Uh, sorry. Now, high-deductible health plans 
coupled with health um, savings accounts, encourage and cover vaccine, and how we can apply those lessons to public programs like Medicare. I'm so sorry, Representative Carter. I think you cut out on me a couple of times so I didn't catch your whole question. Uh, I heard something about a health spending account. Yeah, <laughs> commercial and private plans that are covering vaccines and, and in combination with health savings accounts. Um, don't you, I just wanted you to speak to how high deductible health plans, it, when they're coupled with health savings accounts and how they can encourage and cover vaccines. I think that's certainly a, a wonderful option for those who have those accounts. I think we are, we also have to be aware that you know the access to those kind of accounts are not available to a lot of uh, a lot of adults who are vulnerable to uh, vaccine preventable diseases. And so part of the the, the great the great uh, the great act you know, the, the greatness of the, the, these two bills that we're looking at you know the, the Seniors Act as well as Happy uh, is to try to actually remove those the, the, the payment that's required there. I think even with health serv uh, HSAs as well as um, a high deductible plan, there is obviously that initial co-payment. And unfortunately, a lot of times what happens then, again, as we've discussed many times, uh, you know, even even someone who's on those plans may not see that as the best investment of their their co-pay dollars, if you get what I mean. So I think, mm -hmm. I think this is about equalizing it across for all adults. Great. Well, I'm over. Madam Chair, thank you for your indulgence and thank all the panel for your testimony today as well. Thank you and I'll yield back. Gentlemen.